This is going to be a pretty tame story compared to some others you might have heard, but since it happened to me, I think it's pretty spooky. I'm definitely buying a doorbell camera ASAP, at least. I'm writing this down only a few hours after everything happened, now that I've calmed down a bit and the sun is coming up and I feel somewhat safer. Last night, I was laying down in bed, reading a little bit before going to sleep. I think it's important to clarify that I live on the outskirts of my town. Still in town, technically, but definitely right on the edge, just off the highway that leads out of town and into a 15-mile-long stretch of lots of country. Woods, fields, a few residences, but it's mostly open highway. So, other than the other tenants of my actual apartment building, it's normally a very quiet area. My building is a square with four apartments, and for each of us, our door simply faces right out into the open. There's no lobby or foyer or anything. My door in particular looks out into a large field that goes up a hill. I don't remember the exact time, but sometime between 1 and 2 a.m., someone randomly started banging on my door. That would freak me out at the best of times in broad daylight, let alone in the middle of the night. Nervously, I went to ask who it was. I could hear a man with a deep voice on the other side, claiming he was a police officer, and I needed to let him in right now. That's what he said. I needed to let him in. Not that I needed to open the door for him. Luckily, I watch and listen to a lot of true crime stuff, so I was very quickly suspicious of this man. I got near instant alarm bells because he could not tell me why I needed to let him in. He couldn't tell me what I'd supposedly done and never asked what my name was either. He also clearly did not sound like a cop, if you know what I mean. Obviously, feeling creeped out, I called 911 to confirm this was actually an officer at my address, but they told me there was nobody there. At this point, I was freaking out. I called out through the door that I was on the phone with the police. I could hear the man kind of bang on my door one more time and then immediately stop making noise, I presume because he was running off at this point. They dispatched two cars to my apartment, and the officers took a good look around. Unfortunately, the guy was long gone by the time they got there, and I never saw him at all, so I didn't have a description of him to give them or anything. Thankfully, the cops said two things to make me feel better. One, that they'd post more patrols in my area over the Halloween weekend, and two, it was most likely just a Halloween prank, because the bar down the street from my apartment had just had a party, and it had closed just a few moments before. I suppose the lesson is to always trust your instincts, and remember that if you have any doubts about someone claiming to be an officer, just call 911 and confirm they are who they say they are. Dispatch and the officers who came to me tonight told me you cannot get in trouble just for making sure the person you're talking to is actually an officer. This also applies to situations where it's nighttime and really dark so you can't see for sure if it's a real cop car behind you or not. If you see flashing lights behind you on a back road or dark area at night, put on your hazard lights and call 911 first to make sure it's a real police car. You won't get in much trouble, if any, and it's better to be safe than sorry. So this only happened yesterday, and it's been driving me absolutely crazy. It might not be as wild as some other stories, but it's by far one of the creepiest things that's ever happened to me. So my husband and I are walking home from having a beer at the local pub at around 6pm. In terms of setting the scene, we live in a small New Zealand town with a population of about 2,000. It's a real mixed bag in terms of residents. Older folk, meth heads, low income, but increasingly commuters from our capital city have all been settling down here. We fall into the latter category. It's spring here, so it was still plenty light out. We were chatting as we walked the ten or so minutes home. About three minutes into the walk, at the first intersection, I spotted a cat sitting on the fence of one of the corner houses just on the other side of the street from us. I said meow and it meowed back. They then started stalking a bird, so my husband and I continued watching this house, and the cat really, as we walked past. Suddenly, though, 
I saw a person with a brown paper bag mask over their head kind of stumble out the front door of the house into the yard. Their mannerisms and how they were moving were so strange, but I don't think they were actually like drunk or anything. It wasn't the kind of movement I'd associate with that. The house itself seemed completely dead, so there wasn't a party going on or anything like that. The person then turned and made eye contact with us. At least, the eye holes of the mask were staring at us directly. They slowly started to back away to the front door alcove of the house and disappeared from view into it. We had been slowly walking this whole time, and at this point I had literal goosebumps and an intense sense of dread. When I write it down, it might sound kind of silly, but there was something really creepy about how this person was moving and behaving. We were still looking as we walked back the house, when the paper bag face slowly emerged from the alcove, watching us before disappearing again. As we walked and got further and further away, we could see that face keep popping up in different places, appearing to look at us over and over again. Nothing, and then slowly but surely, that paper bag face would emerge to watch us once more. This continued all the way until we were at the end of the street some 350 meters away, and finally rounded the corner out of sight. It still makes my skin crawl just thinking about it. My husband laughed it off though, and said it was probably just some kid getting ready for Halloween or fucking with us. He's probably right, but I had to keep turning around to watch my back the rest of the walk home, because that shit was so creepy. So after reading a few posts on here, I've decided to add one of the creepier, still unexplained events that happened to me and a group of friends within the past five years. Thinking back on it even, I still get this unnerved, bad feeling that sort of lingers. Anyway, here goes. A group of friends and myself rented a place on a lake for a fun-filled, drunken weekend. We were all in our young to mid-twenties, and it was supposed to be just a big party. For the most part, that's actually what it was. Friday night and Saturday morning, we went all out having a blast on the water and doing fun, stupid stuff. Naturally, when Sunday afternoon rolled around, we were all so dead from going all out, we decided it would be a night of no drinking. Perhaps only a little bit of weed smoking by some of us. Instead, we'd kind of just have a chill evening and night. Because of this, the atmosphere was very relaxed, 9 p.m. comes rolling around, and about eight of us were inside the house. Five were outside. The house was a two-story with a second-story deck slash back porch. It was surrounded by woods. If you walked out through those woods, you would eventually hit the lake. I'll mention that we had already experienced some weird vibes from the locals when we first arrived in town. Mostly just backcountry old-timers that I assume were leering and irritated because we were college-age kids looking to have a good time. The town and the lake were so large though, so it's not like anyone knew exactly where we were staying at. Anyway, three of my friends were on the upstairs back porch, and my other friend and I were downstairs outside just talking on this little old table near the woods. I mean, it was otherwise just a really nice night. My friend and I were getting lost in conversation, when all of a sudden there was this weird feeling that suddenly encompassed us. It was like an unnerving physical experience that came from the woods behind us. It was so strong we both quieted down immediately. Out of nowhere, this loud chanting abruptly started to come from the woods. I had no idea how far away it was. Because of the way the lake was set up, I'm pretty sure the voices carried up and out through the forest. It sounded like a cult chanting away, and all of the voices seemed to be male. I mean, they were very loud and perfectly in sync. We all froze for about 20 seconds. I couldn't contain myself anymore, and darted toward the house with the others following me. I don't know how to explain the feeling that came with that chanting, but it was like a tangible evil, like something so powerfully uninviting. I was shaking by the time we got up to the second story and ran out onto the balcony with the other three friends. One of them was my brother. By the time we got up there, the chanting had stopped. Naturally, I asked, Did you guys hear that? In the most shaky, freaked out voice possible. They had, in fact, all heard it. 
and not seconds later after asking, the chanting began once again. The five of us are all out there peering into the forest, listening to this strange chanting. Sometimes it would sound really far away, then it would get closer and closer until it was relatively close by. All male voices, in the weirdest language I'd ever heard. I don't even know if it was a real language to be honest. It sounded like some strange, extreme church chanting. Suddenly, we heard a loud bang, like someone had just struck a huge metal object. Then the worst part came. A man wailing. Like an extreme pain wailing. All of my hair stood up. It was the freakiest experience ever. My brother and I stared at each other in a mixture of scared excitement and horror. The wailing stopped abruptly. Then it went back to the chanting, which eventually died out altogether. I was so freaked out. I wanted to call the cops right away because whoever screamed surely must have been in a lot of pain. That mixed with the weird chanting made me think some terrible sacrifice was going on in these woods. One of my friends tried to say it had to be some drunk guys just messing around, singing and being weird, but I know there was no way that was coming from some drunk guys. They were all perfectly in sync, and that wail of pain, it was way too real. All of a sudden, it was like all that weird tension and energy just dissipated altogether. I didn't call the cops in the end. I wish I would have, but honestly, the forest was so large anyway, and since the lake house was looking down at the woods and lake, it could have carried out from just about anywhere. It definitely wasn't in our close proximity, but it was close enough to be carried out by the shape of the landscape. We went in and grabbed some of the others, but by the time they came out, everything had stopped and didn't continue from then on. Someone wanted to go explore and find where it had been coming from, but obviously that was a very stupid idea and we didn't do that. After that, I was so ready to go home. I can't explain the relief of driving away from there the next morning. Even now, just thinking about it gives me the worst feeling. Whatever that was, it felt wrong and evil. I'll never forget that moment. I can only imagine it was some weird cult stuff going on. This happened earlier this week and it still freaks me out. I work at a hotel in my town and was driving my husband's truck into work. He was taking mine into the shop this day to get it serviced. He has a very large truck and I only drive it when I absolutely have to. When I pulled into the side parking lot, I noticed the entire lot was covered in snow. No one could see the lines for the spots. So, of course, I began like a moron to try and park in what I hoped was an actual spot, backing up and moving forward several times. When I finally did manage to park, I got out of the truck and grabbed my backpack. All of a sudden, though, I could hear someone yelling from the sidewalk from behind the parking lot. Hey, you need to learn how to fucking park. I was embarrassed, but just closed the truck, locked it, and began to walk to the front of the building. Now, the hotel had a side entrance for employees only. It took a code, though, and I have a really shitty memory. Usually, I would just walk around to the front and go in through the main entrance. All of a sudden, I could hear the guy yelling again. Did you hear me, bitch? I walked faster and took a peek behind me. I could see the man was now following me. I kept walking but called back. Please leave me alone, sir. I need to get to work now. Before I could reach the corner of the building and make my way to the entrance, though, the man sprinted to me and gripped my arm and spun me around. I'll never forget what this guy looked like for as long as I live. He wore dark clothes with a torn-up winter coat. His eyes were extremely bloodshot, and he smelled like a combination of cigarettes and whiskey. I guessed he must have been drunk, but he didn't slur at all when speaking. You're coming with me now. The man began to drag me back to the truck, and I tried to pull away from him. Give me the keys, we're taking a drive. I began to scream for help, and his grip on my arm got even tighter. I'm a 26-year-old woman and not skinny at all but I was a lot smaller than this guy. He was dragging me away so easily, and the snow on the ground just made my feet slide along. I screamed out for help, but no one was around to hear us. 
I kept fighting to get away from this guy. I prayed there would be any guests that could possibly hear me. But it was our slow season, so most likely there would be no one in the rooms on that side of the building. The guy turned back to glare at me. Shut the fuck up and give me the damn keys! Now, I was carrying my backpack on one shoulder. It was big and bulky from my uniform and shoes. I quickly slipped the strap down my arm, grabbed it, and swung it right into his face. The guy let go of me, and I ran for my life to the front doors. I could hear the man screaming behind me, but I ignored him. I was way too scared to look back now. I ran inside and all the way to the employee locker rooms. When I finally calmed down enough, I went to the front desk to talk to security. Sadly, there were no cameras on that side of the building, so none of this was recorded. They called the cops, and I did make a report, though. The cops informed the general manager of the hotel that they needed to seriously consider security cameras on that side of the building, as drunks and druggies were known to be in this area. They got the description of the man, and said they would keep an eye out for him. The manager apologized like crazy about the incident, but I told him it wasn't really his fault. He was a really good guy. I did ask security to follow me out so I could check on the truck, though. Thankfully, it was fine. After that, the security guard promised to make more rounds outside, especially in the early morning. And that was about it in the end. So this happened to me a few summers ago, when I was maybe 15 years old or so. One night, it was business as usual. A few of my close girlfriends and I were getting stoned on the porch of my friend's apartment. We had pretty much been smoking and drinking all day. At 15 years old, yes, please save your life lectures for the sake of this story. I was starting to feel a little bit unwell. It was getting pretty late, so I decided I was going to hit the sack and go to sleep. At this point in the summer, I'd been spending every day at her apartment and practically lived there, so I just went and crashed on one of the couches in her room. The night goes on, and at one point my friends wake me up to let me know they were going to sneak out of the window. She lived on the first floor, and her bedroom window didn't have a screen or anything of the sort on it, so we pretty much came and went as we pleased. She said to make sure to close it behind them. I did make sure to do so. At one point though, a few minutes later, apparently one of the girls opened it back up from the outside because she had forgotten something and forgot to close it behind her. I had already fallen back asleep at this point. Now, something you should probably know about this bedroom before I go any further. The couch that I was sleeping on was about two to three feet away from the window, going directly across the middle of the room. I was sleeping on the couch, so my head was on the side that was directly closest to the window. At some point later through the night, I started to hear some rustling around outside that window. I thought nothing of it at first, assuming it was my friends coming back from whatever adventure they'd just been on. It didn't start to worry me, until I heard the rustling coming from inside this time, right next to where my head was on the couch. If it had been my friends, Surely they would have been louder as they came through the window. Sleepily, I lifted my head up and muttered my friend's name, looking up at this presence. However, instead of seeing my friend's face there, I found myself staring directly into the dark eyes of a stranger. This man had a beanie hanging low on his head, covering his eyebrows, and a scarf that fully covered his mouth and nose. He had his arms through the window, and had been feeling around on the floor. At this point, his body was halfway through already. His face was inches away from mine. We stared at each other for a brief moment. I'm sure I must have startled him as well, because he didn't seem to be expecting someone there on the couch. I started screaming. The man quickly drew himself out of the window and hesitated, as if he was about to run away. Instead, he reached for his belt to grab something. I started screaming even louder. I wear glasses to see and have extremely terrible eyesight, but because I had just been sleeping, I was not wearing them. To me, it looked like he was about to pull a gun from his pocket and shoot me. He pointed it at me, and I tried my best to hop off the couch and hide. I was in a panic state, though, 
and my arms and legs seemed to have missed the connection to my brain. Instead of hearing a gunshot, however, I realized it was only a bottle of mace, a realization that hit me fairly quickly when I felt it burning my face and in my eyes. Once I'd recovered from flailing around from that burning sensation, the man was long gone. I was so startled and freaked out that I could barely breathe. I called my friend bawling, begging them to please come home because I was all by myself. Her mother was currently out of town, and I had no idea what to do. The mace had burned my eyes badly, and I thought I was going to go blind. It hurt to even cry. I couldn't really do anything about it by myself though until they got back. When they finally returned, we soaked a washcloth in milk and laid it over my face to make the burning stop. We called the police as well. They came and investigated, took pictures of my face, the window, the floor, etc. Before finally coming to the extremely smart conclusion that there had never been a man there at all and I'd just been having a delusional dream. My friends all believed me at least, but the police basically brushed it off as a bullshit call and left. For weeks after, I could not sleep. I had anxiety attacks regularly, if I even so much as thought about that man's face. To this day, I have a very difficult time sleeping next to windows opened or closed, regardless of what floor they're on. I always fear seeing some dark-eyed, mace-wielding stranger doing God knows what outside. For some context, I'm a 19-year-old college student, and earlier this past year, I decided to create a grinder profile, because why the hell not? After all, I'm single, so I may as well be a dumb college student while I'm a dumb college student, right? My friends and I were studying late one night in their dorm room like always. All of my close friends lived together in the dorm, so their lounge was the primary hangout spot. It was a little bit after midnight and I decided to go on Grinder. At this point, I'd been on the app for about two months, and had gone on a fair amount of dates by this point. When I opened the app this time, I saw I had received a message from a guy. I don't really remember what his name was, so I'll just continue to refer to him as The Guy. I clicked on his profile, and he was a pretty cute dude. He had a shirtless picture, which was common, and he was attractive enough for me to get more information on him. His caption read, in town for work. I read his bio and he explained that he was in town working. He was staying at a nearby hotel and was able to host visitors there. I replied to his message and began the typical grinder talk. How are you? What are you into? Can you host? Etc. After talking for about a half hour or so and exchanging pictures, we agreed to meet. I must say I didn't get any indication that this guy was a catfish nor did I get an indication I was talking to someone who wasn't who they said they were. Usually it would be pretty obvious when someone wasn't who they said they were. That's what I told myself at the very least. Whenever I decided to meet up with a guy, I'd always tell one of my friends, then share my location with them. I did so this time as well, and decided to head out on my way. This hotel was about 10 minutes away from my university. As I was driving there, the guy messaged me and asked, Hey, so my business partner might be coming back soon. Would it be cool if we just did this stuff in your car? It wasn't an unusual request to engage in car play, but I did start to be a bit suspicious. Why would his business partner be arriving this late? Then again though, I was out this late, so I brushed it off and continued making my way over there. I arrived at the hotel, I would say at about 1am at this point. I looked at my phone again. I had received another message from that guy. Hey, can you pull around to the back of the hotel? I drove into the parking lot and made my way to the back past the pool. This is when things started to get really weird. As I pulled into the back of this hotel parking lot, I noticed a guy in a red hoodie in between some cars. I assumed it was the guy I had been messaging. I pulled into one of the spots beneath a light post, about 20 feet in front of a dumpster that sat in the corner of the parking lot. By this point, the guy in the red hoodie had gone out of my sight. Instinctively, I clicked on the button to lock my doors. I checked the app and received another message from that guy. Yeah, pull back next to the dumpster. 
I assumed that since I was underneath the light, he was worried we'd be caught if a guest or hotel staff saw us or something. At this point, I was starting to get sketched out, though. Maybe it was just my anxiety getting the best of me. I put my car into reverse and pulled back to the dumpster and put my car in park. At this point, I was scanning the lot for this guy, but I didn't see anyone. No sight of that guy in the red hoodie, either. I felt my heart rate increase, and I began to get cold sweats. I remember thinking to myself, man, maybe I shouldn't have driven out here. I checked the app again, only to see I'd received another message. Okay, now turn your car off and get into the back seat. That was the point where my fight or flight response kicked in. Without thinking, I turned my car on and hauled ass out of there. I sped out of that parking lot as fast as my poor 04 car could go. I didn't even stop to check for oncoming traffic when I pulled out of the lot and onto the main road. I drove about two miles up the road, away from the hotel, and pulled into a Mickey D's parking lot. At this point, I was trembling. Maybe, though, I just overreacted. I decided to check the app again to see if the man had messaged me anything further. You know, maybe a what the fuck, why did you leave, or something like that. But I saw the messages from that guy were gone. I assumed he blocked me. And when I checked, I couldn't find his account anywhere, so I don't really know. This leads me to believe that whatever he had planned was not good at all. Was he trying to jump me? Steal my car? Or maybe something even worse? Needless to say, I deleted the app after this incident. To anyone who uses any sort of dating app, be careful who you meet, where you meet, and be sure to take precautions. Our parents told us to never talk to strangers for a reason after all. I live in Florida, and I have for quite a long time now. I love animals, and I have a lot of rescue cats in my life. I appreciate any animals very much, and would do anything to protect them. My neighbor has a German Shepherd, and it really is a beautiful dog. She was a nurse and often worked late and even during the middle of the night. She'd leave her kids at her husband's house often, and had the dog tied up outside. That was because she couldn't just come home and let her out when she needed to do her business. On the night in question, it was just past midnight. I was sitting out on the patio, just enjoying the night air. I don't tend to get a lot of good sleep often, so I'm often stuck awake late at night. It was such a hot and humid night out, so I went out wearing shorts and even still sweating in the heat. That was when something weird began to happen. The neighbor's dog was getting really worked up all of a sudden. I could see her and hear her, and she was acting very strange. She was growling and barking and trying to run around, stretching the leash as far as she could. This was quite unusual behavior for her, and it bothered me. This dog was usually very well behaved and calm, and would just kind of sit there. This gave me a bad feeling. Something in my gut told me I should go over and check to make sure everything was okay there. When I got over to the yard, I noticed that the leash had been tied around the patio tables and chairs. I figured she must have gotten tangled up and wrapped the leash around her on accident, and that was upsetting her. We all know a dog that's done that once or twice. That had to be the problem, right? I untangled the dog, fully expecting her to return to normal immediately. But that just didn't happen. The dog was now even more upset, growling, jumping, and barking. For the life of me, I couldn't figure out what was bothering her. I thought I would just bring her over to my patio and try to keep her company until her owner came home. I knew my neighbor quite well, so I knew this would be okay with her. That night, there was supposed to be this meteor shower or something. I thought it would be nice to just have a little smoke and watch it with the dog laying next to me. I would remain awake and return the dog when the owner got home. I think it may have been about a half hour of us sitting there together, when I heard the most horrifying, bizarre noise I'd ever heard. At first, I thought it was a motorcycle backfiring or something like that, but I lived in a subdivision, and the sound was a lot closer to me than the street had been. I wish I could tell you exactly what the noise was, both before and after, I've never heard anything quite as terrifying. As I listened further, I realized it was some sort of animal growl. 
It was a nastier growl than anything I'd ever heard before. I took out my phone and shined the flashlight. My heart jumped in my chest when I found out just what had made that noise and why the dog was so upset. There was a ten-foot-long gator skulking about the yard, and it was very close to us. I don't know if you've ever been close to a gator that big, but I'm not Crocodile Kevney. I wanted no part in this. I grabbed the dog off my lap immediately. She must have known that gator was hiding there the whole time. I was scared to make any moves. Not the best response to a gator to try and run away. My fight or flight played rock, paper, scissors, and flight won in that moment, though. I held the dog and sprinted to the sliding glass door. I got in and slammed it shut without daring to look back at that gator. As I locked everything up, though, I took a little glance back just to see. That gator was right there on my porch in front of the door. It had tried to chase us as we ran for safety, and I only just barely made it. That night, the dog slept in my house. My cats weren't the happiest about it, of course, but there was no way I was going to let him outside with that gator out there. You hear all kinds of stories about scary humans, ghosts, demons, witches, and things like that on YouTube. But be that close to a gator, and trust me, it will scare the shit out of you much worse than any of those things. Once upon a time, I worked as a supervisor at a fast food restaurant. If you've ever done that before, you know there are all sorts of challenges that come with it. The one that annoyed me the most, though, was when we didn't have enough people to run the restaurant. A lot of times, this was because of turnover, but not always. It also was because there were just times when you were not given enough people to work with. When I would close the store in the evening... I was given three employees to work in with me. This was one person to grill the meat, one person to make sandwiches, one person to make fries and hand out orders in the drive-thru, and me to take orders from the drive-thru as well, collect money from the customers at the window, and take orders in the dining room of the store too. Frankly, my boss was a big wuss, and he would always overstaff one of his other supervisors who was a lazy ass. Because of that, I ended up having to do a lot more work for a lot less money myself. This eventually led to me leaving the company altogether, even when they offered to move me up, give me a store of my choice to work in, and nearly doubled my salary. Just not worth the hassle. Of course, when you don't have enough people working in a restaurant, it's very easy to get some pissed off customers. There was this one particular night when just everything was going wrong. It was really driving me off the deep end. First off, our restaurant served baked potatoes. These take at least an hour to cook, and because of that, it was very possible to run out of them. You can never actually predict how many someone will buy at any given time, and late this evening, we just ran out because we had so many orders. There were these guys in a pickup truck who were really, really angry about this. I tried to apologize and explain the situation, but they just weren't having it. They began to insult me, and even when I offered something else in return, they turned it down and began to throw things at me. Then they drove away, only to come back and drive around the store over and over, enough to set off the drive through over and over again just to torment me. Finally, I threatened to call the police if they didn't stop doing this. When they didn't believe I would go through with it, I picked up the phone and dialed the police. Finally, they drove off. At that point, I walked up to the front counter, because there was a family standing there as well. When I got there, the man sent his family out of the store, and began to scream and yell at me because I wasn't at the front counter the very moment he'd reached it. He even told me himself he had been there for less than a minute, but he shouldn't have had to wait even one second to be greeted and served. Again, I apologized, but the man would hear nothing of it. He began to scream at me. Do you know who I am? Over and over and over. Of course, I didn't know who he was, nor did I even care. Came to find out much later, he wasn't anyone of significance anyway. I could be very patient with people, but when he began screaming obscenities at me and threatening me, I had enough and asked him to leave. He leaned over the counter with wide eyes and asked me, Oh yeah? And who's going to make me leave the store? I picked up the phone. I give free food to the local police department every single day, you know. 
If I call them right now, how quickly you want to guess they'll get here? Why don't you leave? The man did leave, still threatening me the entire way out. Then he violently drove his car out of the parking lot, as if he was making a point by doing so. From there on, I just tried to shove it all out of my mind, although I was so pissed off it was hard to focus. Thankfully, the rest of the night passed on much more peacefully. Eventually, 1am came along and we closed the place down. I let everyone else out of the store, while I finished up the paperwork for the night after the place was cleaned up. That normally would take about half an hour or so. As I was leaving the store, I set the alarm and locked the door. I began to make my way over to my car, but as I was doing this, I suddenly heard a voice right behind me. How are you going to call the police now? The voice whispered in my ear. Turning around, I saw that man from earlier, the one I had thrown out for the threatening behavior. He had something in his hand as well. This was the late 90s. I didn't have a cellular phone, so I couldn't just whip it out and call the police. The man had this crazy look in his eye. I knew he was even more angry than he had been at the store. I was worried about what he was going to do. It looked like he had a wrench with him. I guessed he meant to bludgeon me with it or something. The only thing I could think to do was grab out my car keys. I quickly sprinted over to my car and opened the door, with the man chasing right after me. I hopped into the car with nary a moment to spare, and slammed the door right as the guy slammed his wrench against the side of my car. It smacked against my car door, putting a huge dent in the side of it. The guy tried to smack my car even more. I started it as quickly as I could, and slammed it in reverse. He tried to move behind me even, but I quickly let him know I had no problem running him over with my car if he continued his assault. I clipped his knee as I pulled out, and he stumbled over on himself. I shifted into drive, and drove straight to the police station. That guy had made one really big mistake though. Remember how he kept asking me if I knew who he was? Well, because he'd done this so often, I remembered his full name because I was so upset by him being a little bitch. The police were easily able to find him and arrest him. The moron even kept the wrench he hit my car with, which was easily proven to have been the one that did it. Needless to say, I didn't work in the restaurant business much longer, and once I finally left, I never went back. I'm a female. When I was 16, I lived in the Valley area of Los Angeles, many years ago. As I explained in an earlier story, at this point in time, the best part of my week was Saturday nights, when I would meet my friends at our beloved Under 21 nightclub to dance the night away. The vast majority of the time, I'd have to get a ride there and back. I didn't own my own car until a couple of years later, when I was already in college. Occasionally, a family friend would lend me his car, and on one of these Saturday nights, he did just that. I felt so independent and free to be able to take myself to the club and to be able to leave whenever I wanted as well. On the night of this particular story, I drove to the club and had a typically great time, dancing with my group of friends to music like Prince and Earth, Wind and Fire. At the end of the night, I got into my borrowed car and headed toward home. In case you didn't know this, the San Fernando Valley is made up of many suburban towns. None are very small, and some are very nice. As you'd expect, though, some are less nice, with a higher crime rate. I lived with my family in a medium town in the northern part of the valley. Neither very nice nor very bad, with medium homes on mostly respectably, if not professionally, manicured lawns. Being the greater Los Angeles area, there were many differing routes I could take to get home. Freeways, highways, city streets. It was well after midnight at this time, but most routes I could take would still be bustling on a Saturday night. I'd had my fill of loud music, laughter, and chattering voices, so I opted to take a quieter route home. I took some busy streets, but then veered off into some quieter neighborhoods that would take me home eventually. If I drove through these quiet house-lined streets, I'd surely get home a little faster with no traffic. I was really tired anyway. GPS had not quite been invented at this time, nor even cell phones really. Instead, I had to rely on a written map or just knowing the chosen route. 
I'd heard some bad things about a town called Pacoima, but I'd only really been through it during the day, and maybe once at that. Still though, I knew a route through there would shave a few minutes off my return time. Besides, being someone used to walking or taking buses, I felt blissfully and perfectly safe in a well-running car with plenty of gas in the tank. I was safer at this moment than at any other point in time. At least, that's what I believed. Still, I was a teenage girl alone after midnight, in an area I was unfamiliar with. I was naive enough to think nothing bad could get me in a locked car. This is when I entered a residential street in Pacoima, and only had to go a couple of blocks through to get to the next town, then to my own. As I drove down a dark, quiet avenue of modest homes, there were streetlights illuminating the unknown. This also helped with my feeling of invincibility. As I smiled to myself, enjoying the quiet night, I noticed a few people walking down the street towards me now. At first, I didn't give it too much notice. My left turn out of Pacoima was coming up just ahead anyway. But as they got closer, I realized it was not just a few people. It was a gang of 12 to 20, and they weren't casually walking down the sidewalk either. They were running down the middle of the street, right toward me. I had to suddenly slow down as to not run them over. This is when they all got a real good look at me. I could see they got instantly excited and animated as they realized I was a young girl all alone. Many exchanged smiling glances between them. Others were whooping and whistling as they started to surround me. Smoothly and effortlessly, as if they'd rehearsed this many times, several stopped me completely by standing in front of my car, putting their hands on the hood as others walked around my driver and passenger doors and tried to pull at the handles to open them. I didn't always remember to lock the doors when I drove, and cars didn't have auto locks back then, but I was thanking God I'd had the foresight to remember on this night. Of course, this all happened very fast. In my shock and terror, though, it felt like slow motion. I quickly adjusted my mind from carefree, to possibly being abducted or worse by this large group of people. They had me completely trapped now. I couldn't drive forward, nor could I reverse. This time, the car was completely surrounded. As a couple of them picked up sticks or other objects to try and bust in my windows, I knew I had to do something right now. I did the only thing I could think of. I started to drive forward. Having blocked off my car completely, I could see the surprise on their faces. They knew they had to move out of my way or risk being run over. I immediately decided that if they didn't move now, I would be running them over. All the men standing in front of my car quickly jumped out of the way, and I sped up as I took the left turn out of there. I did make it home safely in the end, but my heart didn't stop beating out of my chest for the rest of the night. Of course, I thought about it for a long time after as well. I was proud of the way I'd handled the situation, but I also kept running through possibilities of what I could have done better next time. What if they hadn't gotten out of the way, and I'd had to run them over with my car? Would I have been able to live with myself? Should I just have sat in place and honked the horn to wake up people in the homes around me? What if the men had pointed a gun at me? I'm very happy it turned out the way it did, but it could have been so much worse. We all have to keep in mind that we're not quite invincible inside a car, no matter how cozy even heated leather seats may make us feel. Dark, quiet shortcuts are not a good idea, especially late at night. And always remember to keep your doors locked when you drive. This is a true story, detailing something that happened to my wife and I three years ago. My wife and I lived in a renovated pool house on my uncle's property, up in a secluded posh neighborhood in the mountains of SoCal. The community was quiet, given the economic status of the residents, and the fact it was several miles up the mountain and far away from the urban neighborhoods. The community was also gated, keeping it even more secluded. That being the case, the only real traffic was people who lived there already, coming up to their Mick Mansions. There were two ways up the mountain, one approach from the south and one from the west. 
Either way, you have to drive up several miles of narrow, windy, one-lane roads that both lead up to these razorback ridges in order to reach the community gates. For those who don't know, a razorback ridge is a narrow ridge with a steep 100 foot or more drop to the bottom. So this night, my wife and I are hanging out with a family who live down the mountain in the San Bernardino Valley. We're out until about midnight, when we decided it was about time to head home now. We started driving. As time goes on, the houses and street lamps get more sparse, and the darkness encroaches as we hit the base of the mountain. As we started to drive up, the street lights were now absent, as well as the lights of the houses. There was nothing but darkness and our two headlights illuminating the way. About halfway up, a thick fog started to develop, not too uncommon for the area. A little dangerous for us, though, given how windy it was and how late at night it was, too. Many people had driven off those windy roads on accident on nights like this and died in the valleys below. Even if there wasn't fog out that had happened, I slowed down and stayed extra attentive to what was in front of us. The steep part of the ascent was soon over, and we reached the Razorback Ridge, just a few more miles till we arrived home. When we reached the top, the road leveled out. The fog now grew even thicker, limiting my visibility to 100 feet or so. Suddenly, I made out a large shape in the middle of the fog. It caught the reflection of my headlights, bouncing off a mirrored surface. I slowed down and came to see a new silver Mazda crossover in the road. The car was not merely parked in the shoulder, though, or even in the traffic lane. It was parked diagonally right across the middle. The back half of the car was in the lane opposite to us, and the front half was in our lane. It was as if someone had come from the opposite direction, veered onto our side, and just stopped right there. This was particularly odd. That meant either someone came from our community several miles further down the way, or had driven all the way up the approach from the mountain bypassing our community, which was the only thing really up there. In either case, it made no sense for this car we'd never seen to be coming out this way this late at night, and to have stopped this expensive car right in the road as well. I could see the car was also empty. All lights were off, doors were completely shut, the car was not running and nobody seemed to be nearby either. No flashlights shining, nobody calling for a lost dog, no flat tires. Just the road, the fog, the silence, this empty car, and my headlights. As I slowed down and we approached the scene, I absorbed it in. The only thing I could think was, this is a trap. Every horror movie and survival video game I'd ever played told me that bandits or creepy creatures were going to pop out real soon. That being the case, I retrieved my handgun and stopped the car, but didn't put it in park yet. My wife was also taken aback. What the heck is this? I said I wasn't sure, and I was going to call out to see if anyone needed help. Despite this creepiness, part of me thought there must be a rational explanation. Surely with a scene like this, someone must need some help. I cracked the window down a bit and listened in. No voices, no wind just the soft hum of my own engine, which went into eco mode when stopped. Hello? Is anyone there? There was no response. Do you need some help, maybe? Nothing. I started to clench my pistol's grip tighter and move my finger slightly closer from the slide to the trigger, anticipating anything. Still, there was nothing, though. After having been there a minute in total, I said the dumbest thing in my life. I turned to my wife and said, Hey, uh, you think I should get out and check what's going on here? My wife looked at me like the dumbass I was and said, Let's go now. Even to this day, I still feel dumb for saying that. As soon as it left my lips, I realized I was sounding exactly like a generic horror movie extra about to get killed in the first five minutes. At that point, I realized it was time to go. I did my best to slowly drive around the car, trying not to fall off that damn cliff, scanning for movement in the fog and the vehicle. Nothing the entire time. We finished our drive home and talked a little bit, then went to bed. For the next week, I checked the Facebook community pages and local news for anything connected to this. Maybe a missing persons report, or a missing dog alert or something, even just anyone else who saw that car. 
but nothing came up. I drove that path again, and even dozen more times at that same hour, but I never saw that car again either. I still don't know what this was about. I can't rationalize it without copping out that it was just some elaborate prank or something. That seems impossible and ridiculous, though. To be honest, it seemed like the road was intentionally blocked. But why would someone block the road intentionally with such an expensive car on this windy, dangerous mountain road in the middle of the night in a severe fog, and then not even come to check on their trap or whatever? It's a strange and creepy mystery to this day. I'm a female. I was 15 or 16 at the time this happened, and I believe it was on Halloween night. I remember feeling a sense of dread on my way home that day. My house was two stories tall, but only had two bedrooms. Most of the space was taken up by the downstairs area. At that time, I slept in the living room on a futon. At the far end of the room were these glass doors in a patio. Didn't have any blinds or anything. I was staying up late playing some video games pretty far into the night due to that dread feeling preventing me from going to sleep. I laid down with my computer still on, lighting up the room somewhat with its ambient lighting. Out of nowhere, I hear something knocking on the glass doors. At first, I tried to ignore it until it started to get more frequent and urgent sounding. I was really freaked the hell out now. I got up without looking at the doors and pretended to sleepily check the front door. As soon as I passed the corner and out of sight of those glass doors, I sprinted up the stairs and hid in the bathroom above the living room. The ventilation system was just some holes in the floor with vents over them so I could look down into the first floor. I tried to wake my mom up and kept on trying to tell her that someone was knocking on the glass door. When she went to check though, they had stopped. She denied that anything had happened and told me to go back to sleep, telling me I must have dreamt it or something. It was all quiet for a while after. At some point, though, the metal spiral stairs into the basement began to creak as well. I could hear footsteps down there. By this time, my computer had gone to sleep by itself, so it was completely dark. I couldn't see anything. The next thing I heard, though, was my jar of pennies that I kept for my collection, falling over and spilling coins everywhere. A few more minutes of silence after. Then the stairs creaked once more, as the intruder sprinted out of the house. Lucky for me, it seemed they had been spooked by my spare change instead of venturing any further. I checked the outside door into the basement the next day. It was unlocked, of course. When I was younger, my mom had a stalker for many years. She was maybe in her early 30s at the time. I was about three years old and my brother was about one when this started. My dad would leave for work early in the morning, and as soon as he was gone, these calls would start pouring in. My mom would answer the phone, and some guy with a voice changer would answer, saying all these horribly sadistic and sexual things about what he was going to do to my mom. Needless to say, she was beyond frightened and didn't know what to do in this situation. Sometimes the caller would even describe exactly what she was wearing at that very minute or even describe what she was doing. At the time, my parents were struggling financially, so it's not like they could just up and move. My mom started to spend more and more time at my dad's mother's house whenever he was away, though. The cops tried to get involved, but whenever they tried to do something, they just couldn't trace the call. After a long time of this, we were able to save up enough money to move. I believe I was around six at this point. Our phone number had been changed many times and unlisted in the phone book. This was around 1988, when everyone still used landlines. The calls continued for a bit, but after enough changes, she never got another scary phone call. She did have nightmares about them for years after, though. I remember when I was little even going into her bedroom one morning and her sobbing into her pillow. I didn't understand at that point, but she explained later in life that it was like she'd just woken up from a nightmare. 
and now she could just shake and cry and let it all out. Only a couple of months after we'd moved away, the cops informed us they'd finally caught the person who was doing this. It turned out to be our next door neighbor's 19 year old son. He had been in the military for a short while, but had been discharged due to severe mental illness. I guess he was put into some sort of special security home now that specializes in mental health care. The lead investigator for the case said that boy was obsessed with my mother. They even found a box in his room full of candid photographs taken of her when she was out in the garden or even playing with us kids in the yard or out and about on town. It still gives me chills whenever I think about it now. Anything could have happened to my mother when my dad was at work and me and my brother would have been far too young to help her. I've got a scary story for you that's a bit different than some of the others. In college, I worked security for some extra money on the side. One of my regular assignments was the overnight shift at a metal fabrication factory. One of the primary reasons I was stationed there was to ensure no one broke in to steal all the valuable metal stocked on site, which was an occasional problem. That in turn involved checking the perimeter fence for damage at least once a shift. That couldn't be done effectively by camera, mind you. Instead, it required physically walking along the fence line. So it was that one night, as I was walking along the perimeter fence, I was in the middle of a thunderstorm. My attention was on the beam of my flashlight, illuminating the fence as I walked past. I wasn't really focused on where I was stepping, despite walking through grass that was a bit over my waist. I lost my footing for a moment. I thought I'd just stepped awkwardly on a patch of particularly slick grass or mud, but as I started tripping downhill, before I knew it, I was sliding feet first into an open storm sewer. It seemed some asshole had stolen the manhole cover. The edges around the opening had been wet with rain and mud thanks to the storm. Let me just take a moment to explain this storm sewer. First off, it was shaped just like an oubliette. If you're not familiar what that is, picture a concrete cell shaped like a jug. A small opening at the top with sides that slope inward to prevent someone from crawling out. In this case, the bottom was maybe 10 square feet, and the opening for the manhole was twice the normal width in the center of the ceiling. There was no ladder attached either. The fall was 20 feet. At the bottom, the floor sloped to form two trenches in the shape of a cross. There were sewer channels going off in four directions, but they were maybe a foot wide across and were blocked with metal grates. At the bottom, there was tons of debris, including a large number of broken pieces of rebar and metal sticking out. There were several pieces pointing straight up toward me. I definitely would have been impaled on several jagged points of rusty metal had I fallen all the way. There was no way to escape now. As I was falling, I knew it would be at least a disabling injury as I reached the bottom. Somehow, I managed to catch myself by hooking the edge of the opening on my elbow as I fell in. I dropped my flashlight to the bottom of the pit before I stopped, so I had a great view of all that twisted metal below me. Now I was struggling to escape. I could barely catch my grip. As I tried to get another handhold, my cell phone slipped out of my pocket and slammed against the bottom. It felt like forever before I struggled to pull myself out of that opening. I don't doubt my adrenaline gave me a considerable boost of strength, but even so, I nearly completely lost my hold on the edge three times before I managed to pull myself up slightly. I was just jerking my knees toward the opening, hoping to jump a couple of inches thanks to momentum. My free hand was scrambling for anything solid to grab onto, but I just couldn't find anything. Honestly, I'm not entirely sure how I managed to stop myself from falling all the way. It felt like a miracle. All I could think after I pulled myself out was how I wasn't due to be relieved for another seven hours. Seven whole hours before anyone would even start wondering where I was. That entire time, I might have been trapped at the bottom of that pit, impaled on rods of rebar in the rain. I wanted to kill whoever stole that damn manhole cover.
So this happened in my senior year of high school. My best friend and I were staying at her house, which was way up in one of the canyons. She had this long, winding driveway. We had been there all day long. Her mom had gone out in the meantime, and she and I were supposed to go meet a couple of friends in Hollywood that night. Anyway, we had been goofing around all day pretty much, watching scary movies and whatnot, and we were starting to get ready for our outing. Her bathroom had one of those his-her double sink deals, so she was near one and I was at the other. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, I got the creepiest feeling. All of the hairs on my arm stood up immediately, and I felt this sudden urge of panic. To this day, it's the most terrified I've ever felt. I was right in the middle of putting on eyeliner when it happened. I caught her eye in the mirror and whispered to her, We need to leave right now. I thought she would be like, what? You're being ridiculous. You know, something like that. But instead, she whispered, I know. My blood ran cold in that moment. We left so quickly that we just grabbed whatever was in front of us. We booked it out of her house and right down the driveway. We weren't even supposed to do this because her mom had just had it repaved. Her car was parked down on the street. We rounded the curve in the driveway, only to see an SUV parked dead center in the middle of the street without any lights on. As soon as the person inside spotted us, the lights turned on full blast and the SUV blared its horn and took off. We scrambled the rest of the way down, totally ruining the new paving by the way. We were just about to hop into her car and drive away and call the police when her mom pulled up right behind us. As we looked back toward the house, we saw some silhouettes in the darkness running away from it. To this day, I don't know if they were robbers or what, but the fact that she and I both got that sense of dread at the exact same moment creeps me out to no end. At the time this happened, I was with my friend outside at around 2 in the morning, playing basketball on his street. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, I got this sudden feeling of dread. My eyes flicked over at my friend, and I noticed he was staring at me with this wide-eyed look. Hey, let's go inside, I said. Yeah, dude, let's get the fuck out of here. Out of nowhere, though, I looked over his shoulder, only to see a gigantic car coming right towards us. I turned around. There was one coming from behind me, too. We shot each other a look again, an instinct now kicked in. There was a field to the side of his house, with a chain-link fence around it. We were both pretty large kids, so we were able to climb up and over that fence real fast. We dashed across the field, only for me to look behind and see three people jump out of those two cars and start running toward the fence with us. We climbed over a second fence just beyond that one, just as the people had hopped the first one. There was a freeway right next to his house, so we climbed up the hill to run to it. We loved climbing this hill to watch the cars, so it was easy enough for us. The people behind us had a hard time, though. We started running along the freeway wall as they struggled to get up the hill behind us. The part that almost turned me to stone, though, is that as we were running, we heard a gunshot ring out in the night and leaves above us being whipped through by something. My veins turned to ice. We hid among the freeway walls and got enough of a lead to call the police. We started to loop back towards where we'd started. The cars were still there, but the people were nowhere to be seen. The police showed up in force moments later. They got the people as they tried to run to their cars and drive away. It turned out those three people chasing us consisted of two men in their late 20s and a woman in her early 20s. It seemed they were wanted members of a crime ring that was kidnapping people and raping them or using them for other things. Just thinking about what might have happened if they'd caught us makes my blood chill and my arm hairs stand on end. One dark and stormy night, I was all alone at home during this storm. I kept on getting this really nasty feeling in the pit of my gut that someone was outside watching me. I went upstairs and peeked out the window. Didn't see anything. 
I opened the front door, made sure the screen door was locked, then shut, locked, and chained the front door to be sure. That way, if someone wanted to get inside, at least they were going to make a hell of a lot of noise trying. Still though, I just wasn't sitting right. At least if someone were to try something, it would give me enough time to grab my gun and call the police, I thought. I'm sure there's some people who would get on me for grabbing a gun before calling the police, but I wanted it in my hand as quickly as possible. If someone was going to get through a door, a phone in my hand wasn't worth shit, no matter who I'd be calling. Because I double-checked everything, I was now feeling a little bit better, but the feeling still wouldn't go away, no matter how much I double-checked to make sure everything was secure. In fact, it just kept on getting even worse. It got so bad I went to grab the gun without even calling the police, just to have it next to me in case. I still tried to tell myself I was just being paranoid because of the storm, though. Maybe I just wasn't used to being alone during it or something. After a while, it got to the point I didn't even want to be in the house by myself, gun or not. I tried to go to bed, but of course I couldn't sleep. I stayed awake, feeling ever more paranoid and anxious. About an hour later, my mother showed up and started questioning me about why I'd been out in such a bad storm, stomping all around the yard. I went outside to check what she was talking about and found boot prints all around my house. Whoever had been out there had been following me as I went from room to room and had stayed still watching me long enough in front of the windows to sink their footprints deep into the mud. That day, I put up vinyl curtains in all the windows so nobody could see inside the house even if the lights were on. I added alarms to the windows and put a door jam armor on all the doors. I put a PVC pipe in the track of the sliding door too and replaced my bedroom door with solid oak. I made sure there was a phone and some sort of weapon in each room of the house as well. That all cost a hell of a lot of money of course, but that incident really freaked me out. I hate to think of what could have happened if whoever it was had decided to really try and break in. Honestly, I don't want to know who it was or why they were there either. I no longer ignore my instincts, and I regularly triple check to make sure everything is in its rightful place. So when I was a real young kid, we had this trampoline, which meant we always had friends over trying to play on it. One night, my mom had left to take a friend home momentarily. My brother and I were like 10 and 12 at the time, old enough to stay home on our own for a few minutes, she thought. We decided we were going to play outside on the trampoline as she left. We lived in a very dense subdivision so the trampoline was on the only piece of grass between our back patio and an alleyway that ran between all the houses. It was just starting to get dark. A car passed through the alley, and my brother waved emphatically at the driver. I jokingly scolded him, saying, Stop waving to random people. Do you want to get abducted? All of a sudden, from the bushes on the opposite end of the alleyway, a male voice called out to us, Yeah, you might get abducted. We bolted faster than I thought humanly possible from the trampoline and stormed into the house. Peeking out the window on the back door, we saw a middle-aged man coming out of the bushes and motioning for us to follow him. Well, of course, we didn't do that. Instead, we locked all the doors and ran upstairs to my brother's room. We armed ourselves with a baseball bat and called our mom right away. Obviously, she called the police and sped home, too. She told us to stay inside no matter what. When the police finally arrived, they did not find that man hiding in the bushes any longer. Their theory was that it was some college kids living on the other side of the alley just playing a prank. There was a fence in between though, and that man who had been on our side of the fence was definitely not a college-aged man. It's terrifying to think that that man had probably been watching us from inside that bush all evening long. We never found out who he was either. So in July 2017, my family and I, mom, stepdad and me, decided to go camping in our city. 
There were some wooded areas with shelters around. My stepdad and I usually went alone, sometimes inviting some of my friends from school. He was the outdoorsy type of guy and had a lot of experience with it. This year, though, my mom had agreed to come along, as long as it was a place not too far into the woods. We agreed and packed all our things, brought some food we could grill on a bonfire, and drove out to said place. When we arrived, we were surprised to see three cars already parked outside of the place. We feared that someone was occupying the shelter already. We went in and nobody was there. To explain it briefly, the wooded area was only really around the campsite, and if you ventured just a few steps further, you would be at a very dirty beach no one ever used. We were a bit confused, but figured maybe it was some people walking their dogs or something. Not even ten minutes later, while we're setting up, a man dressed in all black waltzed through our campsite, not saying a single word, and disappeared into those woods. Me being my paranoid 17-year-old self, I watched him very closely. I was confused as to where he'd gone. The path was very short, and he'd never returned after walking down it. My mom told us she had to use the restroom, and I informed her the man from earlier still had never come back. The night went on, and a lot of cars passed us by. We couldn't see them all, but we could hear them and see the headlights going through the woods. This was not a popular area at all, mind you, and it wasn't really a place where there would usually be a lot of people. The last time we had gone, we had only met a single couple walking their dog and that was it. At one point, a man in a blue jacket started walking towards us. Then he spotted us and kind of hid behind a tree quickly. We were laughing a little bit. It was so obvious he was hiding. We could all see him. After a while of this, he finally stepped forward and walked towards us. He greeted us and stood there awkwardly, and we all shared some confused glances between us. The man then asked us if we were free people. After awkwardly looking at my mom's underwear, we were beyond confused. My mom awkwardly said, yeah, I think so. He just nodded his head. After he did a bit of weird small talk, he just walked straight back to his car. We all stood there, talking about how weird this all was, and how strange it was for all these random men to be walking around here all alone. Come nightfall, I was trying to sleep in my shelter, while my mom and stepdad were sitting and talking by the bonfire. My stepdad had this sort of flashlight thing attached to his head, sort of like a headlamp, I guess, if that makes any sense. Anyway, maybe 50 cars had passed by at this point. They all drove straight through without stopping. At about 1 a.m., though, my mom and stepdad noticed something out in the woods. They saw what looked like a person trying to sneak up on us. They could both see his silhouette out there, and my mom, of course, started getting very scared. My stepdad turned his headlamp to the side so that when he turned his head, it would still look like he was looking straight. Now he could clearly see the man sneaking up from behind a tree and watching them for over 10 minutes without making a single noise. Then, after 10 more minutes of him standing there, he walked into the forest, only for a car to emerge and drive away. At this point, they woke me up and said we had to leave right now. We frantically packed all of our things. I was so terrified as we were doing so, due to them telling me the story while we were packing. Honestly, even to this day, we have no idea what the hell this was all about. My mom has jokingly suggested it was a secret meeting spot for gay married men or something. But I don't know. There's just something weird about watching people in the forest, assuming they don't see you. Yeah, I haven't gone camping ever since. And if I ever do, it definitely won't be at that spot ever again. Oh, also, I don't know if this is important, but I remember every single one of the men we saw wearing a beanie, even though it was in the middle of the summer heat. I don't know, a weird coincidence, maybe. There was this one time I was staying at my uncle's for a while. I wasn't on the best terms with my stepdad, and it was the only option I had financially at the time. My uncle lived in what I would nicely describe as a very, very redneck poor part of town. There were only two roads that led to my uncle's place. One was the long way back into town, 
and the other was the straight shot, where there stood a supermarket right on the edge of town. There was also a short bridge that continued into a very long, very scarcely lit stretch of road for about three miles, and that led to where my uncle lived. When I first arrived, we were driving over that bridge, and my uncle turned and said to me, Be careful around this bridge at night, son. There are meth addicts that live underneath, and they get up to all kinds of crazy stuff. I didn't think much of that because I'd just arrived there. A month or so later, though, I was working in town at a restaurant that I had to ride my skateboard to because I had no car at the time. One night, after an evening shift at around 12 a.m., I realized I had to use the restroom, and the only thing open was that supermarket. I headed that way since I was already going home, and this was an emergency stop, so to speak. There was no way I was going to make it three miles home by skateboard without crapping myself. After a nice relaxing relieving of myself, I was skating across the wooden bridge, thinking about how much noise I was making on this old rickety thing. That's when I realized, damn it, I'm on the meth bridge right now. I popped my board back into my hand and tried to walk as quietly as possible the rest of the way. I really did not want to be noticed right now. Keep in mind this road was very dark. There were only streetlights every hundred yards at most. I was a little ways past the bridge now, thinking about how loud I had been. I was wondering if anyone had heard me, so I did a shoulder check, only to see someone in one of those definitely a homeless meth head windbreaker jackets at the light I had just passed. The instant he noticed I'd seen him, he did this awkward pause and started to look around as if we weren't the only two people on this long, dark road. Then he looked me dead in the eyes. It was weird, man. Like I knew it was trouble by the way his posture was and how hard he was trying to look inconspicuous. Still though, that street was as straight as an arrow and no one had been behind me before I crossed that bridge. I kept on walking calm at first. Then I checked over my shoulder again. The man was even closer now, and gaining on me with every second, I started to increase my speed. At some point I checked and he was even closer. I just started sprinting. There was a street ahead a little less than a quarter mile away. I didn't think I'd make it though. I decided I'd have to run off the road into the brush and hop a random fence. There were plenty of ranches around here, so imagine how spread out everything was. Now I'm running full speed through some random person's property, probably scaring all sorts of animals. I jumped the front fence of said property and hid in a bush near their driveway. My only game plan was to swing my board at his face and try to run for my life again. Well, unfortunately for me, the owner of that property just so happened to be arriving home in his pickup truck and was obviously quite pissed to see me hiding in his bushes. He ran over and started screaming at me as to why I was crouched in a bush at the end of his driveway. The whole time he was yelling at me though, I was explaining that I was being followed by someone. That exact moment is when I saw the silhouette of the man following me right on the other side of the bush. I could tell he'd heard me. He slowly started to back away him making eye contact the whole time as he retreated. I knew that he'd just heard me trying to explain myself. The owner of the property saw that guy too and stopped his screaming at me right away. In fact, he chilled with me for a minute or two. When I asked for a ride, he said he couldn't help me, unfortunately. I had to walk the rest of the way back to my uncle's by myself. That shit was crazy and scary. A pretty gnarly one for me really felt like I was being hunted. This happened 10 years ago when I was 19 years old. I was working at a factory at the time and shared a one-bedroom apartment with a former friend of mine. She let me take the only bedroom, and since the living room was huge anyway, she just slept under the big bay window with a privacy screen between her bed and the couch. Anyway, we used to always joke about this particular building being haunted. A guy had died in our apartment by suicide years before, 
and sometimes out of the corner of your eye or whatever, you could swear you'd see a person standing in the bathtub behind the curtain or sitting in the chair in the living room. Of course, every time you'd go to look, there would be nothing there. We only ever saw anything though when the window was open. As long as that window was kept closed, there would be no problems. I guess that could easily be explained away as group hysteria or whatever. One night though, as we were sitting there shooting the shit, there was this faint knock at the door, almost barely audible. We were both a little bit unsettled. Something about this just didn't seem right. I can't explain though what about it sounded so off. All I know is I went into fight mode immediately. The mom jeans were strong even back then. I grabbed my knife, which I used for scaring away rambunctious drunks, and walked slowly over to the door. Right as I went to reach for the knob, it turned and started to open. I yanked it open the rest of the way, only to see there was nobody there. I saw the doorknob turn. My roommate saw it turn too. I yanked that door open and searched up and down the hallway. There was nothing there. All of a sudden, as I turned around, I heard this sound like someone sprinting up the stairs to the second floor. It scared the hell out of me right then and there. I slammed the door shut as hard as I could. Maybe it was because I'd heard footsteps, but no breathing or any other sounds. It just really unnerved me. I slammed the door, locked it, locked the deadbolt, locked the other deadbolt, and put the chain on too. I propped a dining chair up against the handle for good measure then went and did the same thing to the door in the kitchen. I closed every curtain so nobody could see inside my apartment either, and we both slept in my bed together that night. I'd never hugged that knife so tight in my entire life. I don't know if it was a ghost or what, but two months later I moved out of that apartment and into the one upstairs, and things there were even worse. On a Friday night, I fell asleep on the couch, and my husband tiptoed to bed to let me rest. I'd been having some trouble sleeping, and was recovering from a sinus infection at the time. Our couch was pushed right up against a wall, just below a window. Our cat often liked to walk or sit on the back of the couch and try to look out that window. We tried to remember to keep the blinds cracked a little so she could at least see out. Our house was fairly high off the ground. My husband is around six foot four, and when he's at the ground level, I can only barely see his mouth from the top of his head through the window. Anyway, I was sleeping. A sound woke me up, and in my grogginess, I thought it must be the cat fucking with the blinds to peek out again. That was pretty normal behavior for her. In my sleep, I kind of rolled over and vaguely swatted at the back of the couch behind my head. I grumbled something at her too. Usually that was enough to get her to stop. The sound continued though. This time it was a bit different. I was still mostly half asleep, but suddenly there was some sort of metallic scratching. I opened my eyes, now very confused. I sat, stood up, and turned around, fully expecting my cat to have found some more annoying way to mess with my sleep only to lock eyes with a man who was now prying my window open. I saw from the nose up. His eyes got real big. I screamed. He started to run away. I yelled and my husband grabbed his gun. The cops were called as well. It turned out that more than five homes in our area were broken into that very night. In more than one instance, the man had entered the home and poked around, stole things, ate food, even left without the owners ever waking. Had he managed to get into our house when he crawled through that window, he would have landed right on top of me, and who knows what he would have done then. When I was younger, around 15-ish or so, I was part of my local guide troop. We went to an annual fair slash show thing, where you could go and buy bags of stuff, see wood chopping, go on rides, etc. I kept on getting this feeling throughout that something wasn't right all day. Every time I turned around, I would see it. A clown, following me and my friends around. 
the same clown every time I looked behind us. It watched my group when we were heading towards where the train platform was even, followed us the whole day. It was a horrible feeling I'd never forgotten, and a few years after the clown incident, I suddenly felt it once again. I was just finishing up my shift at work when I noticed an older man hanging around the front of my store, near where I was situated. No big deal, right? Probably just waiting for someone. I left and headed down to wait for my bus home, completely oblivious, except for that odd feeling in my stomach. I sat down to wait for the bus, only for the old guy to walk by me and sit a little bit further down away from me. Okay, seemed he wasn't with anyone then. I got on my bus and sat to the left of the driver at the front. The guy also got on as well. At this point, I was thinking, well, I'll just get off a few stops early and see if it really is just a weird coincidence. I got off, only for the man to get off too. I walked briskly across the road, over a couple of empty lots, to the nearest block of shops and walked in. I looked at the lady behind the counter and whispered to her, I think some guy is following me. Can you act like I have an appointment, please? The man waited outside for a moment, but eventually he disappeared. Me and a couple of the ladies looked out the front and back, but we couldn't find him anywhere. I dead sprinted home, jumped into my house, and closed all my blinds and chained the door shut. I was texting my mom while having a panic attack and watching through a slit in the blinds. I could see the old man, now walking back and forth through my neighborhood multiple times. I ran to the kitchen and laid down on the floor, away from all my windows, until my mom came home finally. I didn't see the man again after she arrived, although that man did seem a bit similar to that clown I'd seen all those years ago. This has been on my mind a lot lately, so maybe sharing it will help me get some of this off my chest. So, my father is a criminal, a violent criminal, but I didn't know that when I was little. I didn't know what my father was. To me, he was my daddy, my hero. He protected me from bad dreams and taught me all sorts of things. Sure, sometimes he got mad and hit me or pulled on my hair, and sometimes he thought it was funny to put dead spiders in my hair just to scare me, but I thought this was normal stuff all dads did to their kids. Dads were supposed to discipline their kids and pick on them every now and then, right? My dad loved me. I didn't know, though, that the man I thought was a superhero was really a monster. Then came the night my whole world changed. My life changed. On this particular night, me and my younger brother were in deep sleep, when we were suddenly awoken to the sound of a woman's desperate screaming. I was eight, and my brother was seven. It was the most terrifying sound we'd ever heard. We heard her screaming and begging for her life, my dad's voice yelling in anger. And what I now know was the sound of him beating her. Of course, I didn't know what was going on. I only knew my dad must be doing something terrible to that woman. The man I thought was my dad wouldn't hurt anyone who wasn't trying to hurt us. I thought he was a good person. When I realized he was the bad guy, I couldn't trust anything anymore. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know if he was going to come after us for hearing this. I just knew I had to protect my little brother in that moment. My dad heard us crying and burst into the room. I hugged my brother as tight as I could while my dad screamed at us. Thankfully, he didn't do anything to us other than throw a few things around us. He went back out and began beating the woman once again. I kept holding my brother, rocking him back and forth, telling him not to cry. Everything was going to be okay soon. Then we heard a gunshot. Our grandfather was a hunter, so we knew what guns did, and we knew they killed things. For a few seconds of silence after that gunshot, I really thought my dad had just killed that woman, and maybe we might be next. I was actually thankful when she began to scream again. Screams at least meant she was still alive. I don't know how long I sat in that room holding my brother, trying to figure out what to do, how to get help. We had to listen to that woman suffer, being terrified we'd be next. 
Eventually, my dad moved the woman away from the room we were in, and then he left altogether. Turns out he'd hogtied her and chained her up in a doghouse. Sometime after that, the cops came and took us away from that home. It's been 16 years since that happened, and every night I still have nightmares of that woman screaming. So this happened a few years back, when I was living in a suburban area. I used to ride my longboard around at night and just glide through the sleeping streets as a way to relax and wind down from work. I always rode my board alone. One night I was riding my board as usual, crossing through intersections, when I started getting to the end of the street and to a new one. It was a cloudy night, but the streets were lit with various street lamps. A little bit further up the road, underneath one of these lamps, I thought I could see a man standing there. He seemed to be in a full body suit, all black. I slowed my board down and nervously laughed, calling out to the man. Hey, uh, that's a nice costume. The man's head shot up to look at me, but he didn't say a word. At this point, I picked up my board and was now holding it. The man slowly started to stumble towards me, and my mind went blank. For some reason, I didn't jump back on my board. I just started running away from him as fast as I could. When I looked back, I could see he was now sprinting after me. I had never been so scared in my life. As I continued to run down the street, I found a family sitting outside on their porch. I approached them, as I realized what I was about to say sounded batshit crazy. I told them about the man in the bodysuit, and they let me stay on the porch with them to blend in. After a few more minutes, we saw the man come walking down the street, doing some bizarre motion waving his upper body back and forth. We watched as the man glanced over at us and then continued to walk down the street in this strange motion before disappearing around a corner. Thankfully, the family were nice enough to drive me home and not make me walk all the way back with that guy out there because I sure didn't feel safe doing that this night. To this day, I still don't know what that was. Sometimes I maybe think I even just saw something. Maybe because it was around Halloween and somebody just thought they were being funny. I don't know, but this was one of my worst experiences ever. I saw a drive-by shooting not even a month ago. My wife and I had decided to go to a food truck meet at our local park, figuring it would be a nice outdoor adventure for our eight-month-old son. Driving down that street, there are generally cars parked on both sides, and this day was no exception. As we approached this row of cars, a white minivan turned onto the road headed towards us. Being a nice guy, I stopped to let him through first, except he didn't come all the way down. He stopped about 15 feet in front of us. All of a sudden, he pulled out a gun and started shooting at the people right in front of us. In no way do we live in a bad neighborhood. It was typical suburbia. One man was shot and killed pretty much instantly. A second girl was shot in the back while running away, blood pouring from the wounds in her back. I threw my car in reverse and slammed it to try and get out of there. After that guy had finished shooting that couple, he hauled ass towards my family. Now we were in reverse, trying to get away from this situation. That's all I could think to do. The man continued to drive towards us and tried to box us in with his car. My eyes locked with his. In that moment, I felt a feeling I couldn't describe or even knew existed before. Bone chilling would be just the tip of the iceberg in description. I had never been more fearful in my entire life. All I was focused on was the safety of my wife and son. The man raised his gun as if to shoot, and then he simply drove away. It shook us up bad enough to want to move far away, and at the end of the month, we're moving out of state to a quiet mountain town, and I'm going to try my best not to think about it again. A few weeks ago on a Saturday night, 
I let my dog Riley into the backyard. He was out there for about 10 minutes, so I opened the back door to call him inside. He didn't come right away though, which was weird because he usually did. I closed the back door and waited. After about five or so minutes, I opened the back door once more to let him in. Riley! I called. No response. Riley, come inside. It's time for bed. Again, no response. This is where things started to get weird. I whistled for him to come back. Then, from the other side of the yard, I heard someone whistle back. The exact same whistle I just whistled. What the fuck? I muttered under my breath. I thought it must have just been my imagination, so I whistled again. And again, this mystery person whistled back. I shut the door and locked it right away. I went to my grandparents' bedroom and peeked out the window to see if I could see anything. There was nothing there, it seemed. I went back to the kitchen, where the back door was, and flipped the porch light on. I went back to the bedroom, looked out that window too, and again, there was nothing to be seen. After that, I decided to go to the living room and tell my grandparents what had just happened. My grandpa told me to grab a flashlight and Riley's leash and check it out myself. He said the whistling was probably just the neighbors across the alley. I grabbed a flashlight and Riley's leash and turned off the porch light because I was afraid of what I might see with it on. So afraid, in fact, I didn't even know if I planned to use the flashlight either. I was a small, skinny 16-year-old male and not good at fighting either. As soon as I stepped out into the cold, dark night, I wished I had gone to my room and retrieved a baseball bat instead of a flashlight. Slowly, I made my descent of the front porch steps. I know I must sound like a little wuss right now, but that shit was fucking scary. One time last year in the middle of the night, I'd heard someone slam the cellar door shut. That had scared me so badly. I was even more scared now. I stopped on the second to last step and looked out into the yard. I finally got enough courage to call out. Riley? I called. From right behind me, I heard a soft voice whisper in my ear. Riley? I turned to see a face peering at me from underneath the porch. I couldn't even scream. The face peering at me was crazed, looked like a crackhead, which was common from where I live. I ran up the stairs. I threw a kick into the dude's face between the spaces so he couldn't grab at me as I ran. Then I jumped inside. I told my grandpa what happened. He grabbed his gun and came back out with me. We searched the whole yard. No sign of that crazy guy, nor my dog Riley. The back gate was wide open, and there was blood on the stairs where that man's face was at. Blood, I guess, maybe from his lip or something. The cops were called, of course, and I explained everything to them. After they spoke to me, they left. Haven't heard anything from them since. Thankfully, the next morning, we found Riley perfectly fine, just standing in some random person's driveway. That was good, at least. My guess as to what happened is that the crazy man had already been in my yard when I let Riley out. Riley must have discovered he left the gate open and left to wander around. It was a pretty terrifying experience. I'm just glad my dog wasn't hurt in the end. So let me start off by saying I really like to explore old mines. It's kind of a thrill for me because I'm mildly claustrophobic. That sounds weird, I know. Why would someone explore an old mine if they're scared of enclosed places? The thing about it, though, is that it really gives you a kind of a rush. When I was a kid, I got lost in a cave, you see. And although it did freak me out quite a bit, it also made me feel so alive. When I began to explore, though, I chose mines instead of caves because mines are harder to get lost in. Caves are a lot more scary in my mind. Generally, I just travel to the end of the available mine, my heart pounding in my chest the whole way. Then I'd try to get out as quickly as possible. Each and every time I swore to myself I would never again go into another mine, but I'd always get the itch to go just once more, almost immediately after I'd left. I was going to explore a mine in West Virginia. 
I won't mention the name of it because technically I didn't have a legal right to be there. I actually even had to park my car on the side of the highway and walk there, which was a pretty big risk. There were no cars coming for a while, so I jumped the railing and the fence and made my way over toward that mine. I had done tons of research to try and find where this place was online, so I was able to figure it out pretty quickly. I knew this one was going to be a relatively straight trip from the portal slash entrance to the mine to the back. It was about a thousand feet deep or so. There was a chance that by the time I got to the end, I wouldn't even be able to see the entrance anymore. My heart instantly began racing as I thought of that. Fortunately, although the mine was a bit damp, it wasn't very wet like some of the others I'd encountered, so I wouldn't be having too difficult a time. So there I was, entering the mine, and of course my heart started beating faster right away. I had to walk very slowly, because I didn't want to get surprised and trip on anything. No one knew where I was, so if I got hurt, no one would be able to find me, and I'd have to get out of trouble myself. I made a habit of turning around every 50 feet or so to look around and make sure I could still see the entrance. Of course, it got smaller and smaller the further I went into the mine and the more my heart thudded in my ears and my chest. When I'd gotten halfway deep into the mine, I thought, I turned around and saw the entrance was now very, very far away. It was just barely visible. The mine was so dark, too. I had a small flashlight with me to see where I was going, but I didn't want to use it until I absolutely had to. As I mentioned before, the only reason I did this in the first place was because I so enjoyed the thrill of being scared that the flashlight would have kept me from being so. As I descended further into this mine, I thought I heard a sudden sound. It sounded a bit like a giggle or something. I immediately stopped in my tracks and tried to listen a bit closer. After a few moments of nothing though, I decided it must have just been in my head. I began to walk a bit further. About 700 feet into the mine, I heard that same giggle once more. I again stopped, this time feeling my heartbeat leap into my throat. I turned around and looked at how deep I was in. I considered going back for a moment, but I figured this must just be in my imagination. Who the hell would be down here other than me? I wanted to make it as far in as I could go, so I kept on walking. When I got closer to the end of the mine, I heard that giggle again. Only thing was, this particular time, I was absolutely sure I just heard this. Close by, too. It was not my imagination. This time it didn't stop either. It was coming from right behind me. I fumbled in my pocket and pulled out my flashlight. I flipped it on, turning around. Sitting right in front of me were two little girls holding their hands over their mouths while they were laughing. They looked at me, and in the darkness their eyes looked completely black. One of the girls took her hand away from her mouth for a moment and pointed behind me further into the mine. I dropped my flashlight in surprise. It broke on the rocks, but I didn't care about that right then. The laughing didn't stop, even though I couldn't see either of them anymore. Immediately, I began to sprint my way back out of the mine. The giggling didn't seem to get any quieter, though. Actually, I thought those girls must be following me. It remained almost completely dark until I was almost back to the entrance of the cave. I didn't dare to look back. I hopped out of that mine and ran to my car, which fortunately was right where I had left it. That was not my last time in an abandoned mine, but I can tell you it was the last time I ever went to that one. I watch a lot of videos, and I found one where a person was talking about hanging out in the closet and listening to creepypastas. That struck a chord with me, because actually I do that quite a lot too. Once, I had a very freaky experience while doing so. I just had to write about it. I mean, what are the chances someone else would be in that same situation I was? Much like the person in that story, I thought it was the best way to try and get scared by these creepypastas. 
It was the only place in my home I could go where it was completely dark. Once I even tried putting duct tape over my bedroom window to keep the light out, but uh, that didn't work so well. On this particular night, I was sitting there in the closet listening to some really good creepypasta, although I was having a pretty hard time getting into the right mood. I closed my computer lid and tried to listen to it that way. At least then, it would be totally dark without the monitor on. That didn't really do very much for me, though. It kind of sucked, actually. I was hoping that the darkness would really get me into the ambiance and get me scared, you know? That's what the dark is supposed to do. But it just wasn't happening tonight. At least I was having a good time listening to the stories themselves, as they were pretty good. I had been listening to this particularly long playlist, and must have been in the closet for about three hours. I moved and stood up for a few moments to stretch my legs. It was about two in the morning as I did so. Right as I leaned against the closet wall, the closet light turned on. The light switch was right outside the closet door, on the left side of it, and I lived alone. That meant someone just flipped that switch, and not only had they just done that, they must be standing right outside the closet door. I froze, finally feeling that fear I'd wanted so badly to feel. Now I was really regretting it though, I had no idea what to do. I didn't have anything to protect myself with, it was just me and my trusty laptop computer in there. All I could do was stand there in complete fear, expecting any moment the door was going to burst open. When it did, I was sure I was going to die. I stood there and watched and listened, but no one opened that door. I waited for hours because I was too scared to check myself. When the sun finally rose, I got the nerve to open up the door myself. I looked around my room. It seemed there was no one there. Cautiously, I staked out the rest of my apartment for a hidden intruder. I didn't find anyone, but I did find my living room window wide open, with the screen removed. My PS4 and my television were gone as well, so I guess I had been robbed. Someone had come into the house, who must have known I was there in the closet. Did they scare me because they knew it would give them time to rob me, and I would be too freaked out to explore outside? Or did they think that light was for something else, and left when they turned it on and discovered me there? I have no idea, but that was the freakiest experience of my life. Make sure your windows are always secured. When I was about 13 years old, I used to love going to explore out in the hills around my aunt's house. It was really fun, and I often found some really interesting things out there too. One time, I stumbled upon this cave. Part of me really wanted to go and explore it, but I knew it really wouldn't be a good idea by myself. I decided to save that for another time. When I went home though, it really began to bother me. I regretted not exploring that cave. I felt like I was some sort of coward some way, and I really didn't want to feel that way. I wanted to go back and find out what was in there. About a month later, I went to stay with my aunt again. This time, I knew I was going to seek out that cave and explore it to its fullest. I brought a flashlight and a snack and some water as well. I didn't really need much because I knew it would be a shallow cave, and it wouldn't take me very long at all. After about an hour of exploring the hills, I finally found that cave again. I guess I should explain the kind of cave it was. It was on the rocky side of a hill, and the entrance was quite short. I would have to get on my belly and push myself under it. Looking at it, I knew it would be an extremely tight fit. My curiosity was really strong though, so I decided to go ahead and go for it. I got down on my belly and slowly began to crawl into that cave. I wasn't sure how deep it was or if it ever got any taller. What I was sure about was that it was very dark inside. The entrance was so small that not much light was able to get inside it. Thank God I decided to bring the flashlight with me. Right as I began crawling in further though, I became aware of this really odd noise, a sort of rustling sound, 
followed by a weird shrieking noise. It sent a real shiver down my spine. In a bit of panic, I moved down a bit. I moved my foot and got it wedged in tight between the ceiling and wall. I groaned out of pain and out of desperation for my stupidity. I tried to pull my foot out, but I wasn't able to move it because it was throbbing in agony. I cried out a bit, and then I heard that rustling noise again. It was too dark to see anything, so I grabbed for my flashlight. The sound was probably just nothing, but I would of course be scared until I knew that for sure. I moved my hand on the flashlight and switched it on, then moved it toward the direction of that sound. I saw the worst possible thing. A cave full of the scariest looking bats I'd ever seen, only a couple of yards away from me. They were hanging from the ceiling, and all of them were staring at me. I screamed and did my best to pull myself free. My leg throbbed in agony as I moved. I don't know what it was, the crying or the flashlight, but the bats got restless, and they started to fly right at me. Stupidly but instinctively, I swatted at them to defend myself. Two things happened in that moment. My leg finally pulled loose of the wall, and the bats began to bite me because I'd swatted at them. It felt like I was jabbed with sharp, thin needles. I screamed again and tried to pull myself out of that cave. If you've ever seen the movie Terminator, my experience was very similar to Sarah Connor's climbing through the machinery at the end. My leg was injured now, and I was crawling through an area that my body was wedged into. I was panicked and scared of the bats all around me trying to bite me. I was scared I was going to get something real bad because I'd just gotten bit. It took me a long time to crawl my way out. I was breathing heavy with fear, and I had never felt so claustrophobic before. It took me a long time to get out, and by the time I did, I was hyperventilating. I tried to stand up on my foot, but my leg gave out. I had to crawl the rest of the way until I was able to get a broken branch on the ground I could use as a crutch. I was hurting real bad, and I was scared I had probably just contracted rabies. I felt super sick. It took me nearly three hours to limp back to my aunt's house. In my gut, I just felt I had rabies and was going to die. If I had been more educated about bats, I would have known that only one half of one percent of them actually carry rabies. My feeling of being sick was probably psychosomatic, exacerbated by my fear and anxiety of hurting my foot. But I had to get a rabies shot anyway. It wasn't nearly as bad as people might tell you it is. Still not pleasant by any means, though. Turns out my ankle had been fractured, and I had to get a cast for it. Nowadays, I don't go into small caves or other small areas either. I'm completely claustrophobic, and although more educated about bats now, I'm scared shitless by them. When I was around 15 or so, my mom and stepfather got divorced in a pretty dramatic way. The whole household was turned upside down, and everyone's routines were thrown off. Mom was out doing something most nights after work. My little sister spent more time with her friends, and I became something of a night owl, usually waiting until the wee morning hours to lie down. Our house was a simple one in a rural area, two stories with a huge backyard sharing a fence with both a cow pasture and the entrance to these really thick woods. The house had a lot of problems, but I enjoyed taking over the maintenance and gardening work. They gave me something to do when I was feeling depressed at the time. For some perspective, our kitchen windows looked out directly to the fence described above. The left half of it bordered one of the black corners of the big cow pasture, while the right half bordered the entrance to the woods. It had a rather overgrown trailhead on that side, just barely visible from the kitchen window. For the most part, though, all you could really see was overgrown grass and shrubbery, at least four or five feet high. Perhaps some low-hanging trees of mixed oak and cedar variety. This backdrop added a sort of eerie tranquility to our property, which I appreciated from the very first day we moved in. 
One night, I took a break from my homework after realizing I'd stayed up way too late on a Thursday night, even for my standards. I went downstairs to make some food, and my dog followed behind me like she always did. There I was, making a grilled cheese in the kitchen. While I was at the sink cleaning out the pan for the next batch, I noticed some of the grass from the wood lines start to shuffle around. Now that really startled me at first, but as soon as I began to fixate on it, I saw no more disturbance. We lived in wildlife country at the time, so I figured it was probably a deer, a coyote, or a cougar. Unsurprising for the latter, given the farmer who owned the pasture had dozens of cows, and sometimes did not bring them in at night. Strangely enough though, I began to notice this even more often in the nights following. Always, whenever I was doing dishes after eating, I would look out the window, only to see grass shuffling around, then see nothing further as I fixated on the spot. I was always a fan of scary movies, and I tended to be a jumpy kid already. Each time I did my best to convince myself I wasn't really seeing any sort of pattern. This changed though, when my dog would start fixating on the woods too, and barking at night. Furthermore, our motion sensor security light began to stay activated sometimes, for hours on end, only switching off when I would go to the kitchen to make my midnight snacks. Eventually, I told my mom all about this, and while she did initially seem concerned, she also pointed out that we did leave behind the woods after all, so we should expect animals or occasional homeless squatters nearby our property. If I was really that concerned, I could always just call the police or animal control. I didn't really disagree myself, and for the most part gave the matter no further thought each night forward. One particular night, though, I decided at 1am spontaneously to take a dip in our hot tub in the backyard. I changed and my dog and I went outside. I climbed into the tub, closed my eyes, and zoned out like usual. I was suddenly whipped out of my trance when I heard a loud crunch, followed by what sounded like someone falling over into some bushes. I stood up immediately and turned around. Who's there? No one replied. It was dead silent, and I had the creeps now. I quickly put on my robe and rushed inside. The very next day, I told my neighbor, friend, and at the time crush about this. She thought I was being ridiculous but nonetheless agreed to go with me to check out that part of the woods to see if there was any evidence of anyone or anything hiding in that direction I'd heard the noise coming from. We stomped through the woods until we got to where we could see the back of my house. We checked under every shrub and blackberry bush, but found nothing. It was probably just a coyote or something, deciding whether or not you would make a good dinner. The neighborhood girl said, smirking, I playfully flipped her off and laughed, quietly relieved there was no creepy person stalking me the previous night. Well, of course, I was wrong about that. Because that night, as I was making my usual dinner, our security light came on once again. I raced to the back door to see what was up. This time, though, I could barely make out a shadowy six-foot figure disappearing through the trailhead and into the brush to the right of it. My heart skipped a beat and my dog, probably sensing my nerves, began to growl furiously. I called out into the night, Who the fuck's out there? Come out right now! Of course, there was nothing but silence. After sitting in the dining room for an hour, I figured I must be being paranoid. Maybe I was seeing something subconsciously, afraid of being out in the dark. I called my neighbor back, and she surprisingly didn't call me crazy this time. She told me she would tell her dad about it in the morning. I never saw that sort of thing again, and my neighbor's dad just chalked it up to being a homeless person camping out in the woods, very most a stalker from one of the houses around ours, something he explained wouldn't be surprising, as my sister was quite a looker. He thought it would make sense she would have a stalker, as if that was supposed to make me feel better or something. I suppose, though, in the end it did, Months passed by and I forgot about this fairly quickly. That is, until a local news bulletin came out about a sexual predator having been recently apprehended by local police. It was a report from a couple living a few houses down from us 
filed about the wife being approached at night by a tall, gaunt man in the evening hours when she was watering her garden boxes. She said he'd suddenly appear from the woodwork, quietly as if trying to sneak up on her. When she noticed him, she demanded his name, but he darted back into the woods. She called the sheriff immediately, unlike me, and a half an hour or so later, the department combed through those woods and apprehended the man, who was hiding underneath a fallen tree nearby. All the reports said was that the man claimed he had been living in the woods for months, surviving on snacks stolen from a nearby gas station, and would not give a reason for why he was out there. Supposedly, he was wanted for numerous sexual offenses on minors and vulnerable adults some years prior, whatever those ended up being. Now, years later, I still get uncomfortable looking out into the woods at night, anywhere I may live. Who can blame me? When I was around 12 years old, my father bought me a pup tent so I could have sleepovers in the backyard with my best friend, Jimmy. Once it got warm enough outside, Jimmy and I would spend many a night out in the backyard. April of that year on a Friday, I asked Jimmy if he would want to come over and have a camp out once more. He happily agreed, of course. About a half hour after he arrived at my house, though, these dark clouds began to roll in. My mom tried to cancel our camp out, but after I begged and pleaded with my father, he managed to convince my mom that Jimmy and I would be completely fine. After all, we were just going to be hanging out in the backyard by ourselves. It's not like we were actually going out into the woods or something. I was really excited myself. The storm was just going to make the night that much more enjoyable. Jimmy and I would tell a bunch of scary stories, and it would give a really good freaky ambiance with the storm outside. We watched a bit of television as a bolt of lightning momentarily lit up the sky. It still hadn't begun raining when we went out to the tent, though. If you've never been in a tent when it's storming, you're missing out on a very surreal experience. Even before the rain began to fall, the wind was hitting the tent hard. We could hear it howling all around us. Each crackle of lightning not only lit up the entire sky, but also easily shone through the thin fabric wall of the tent. Well, when the rain finally did begin pouring down, I guess I suddenly understood why my mom didn't want us spending the night out there. That poor little tent got battered by the rain slapping against it. Jimmy and I spent our night doing our best to try and scare each other. We had a flashlight, and the person telling the scary story had to hold it under his chin you know, to make it seem like it was more scary than it really was. Or at least, more scary than we would admit it really was. There are many reasons I remember that camp out in the storm so well. One of them is that this was the very first time I was introduced to some of those classic all-time urban legends. Jimmy told them all. The Hook Man, the one with the headlights and the killer in the back seat, and many, many others. I would say by the time it was fully raining, we had succeeded in scaring the crap out of each other. My dad came out to check on us to make absolutely sure we were okay before he went to bed. Mom was still trying to convince him to make us get back in the house and sleep in my bedroom. My dad understood that we were just having a good time though. After he knew we were fine and we promised we wouldn't stay up too late, my dad wished us a good night and went back inside the house. About 20 minutes after that, the lights all went off as well, and Jimmy and I had the chance to really scare each other. I wasn't really aware of how much time was passing by as we kept talking and sharing stories back and forth, but it had been quite a while now since everyone else had gone to bed. We were staying up way later than we should have been. All of a sudden, there was a really bright flash of light and a crack of thunder that shook the ground. It wasn't really the thunder that worried me, though. During that very brief bolt of lightning, I'd seen a shadow in our backyard. Since the light was so brief, I hadn't really had much time to make it out through the wall of the tent, but it looked to me like there was a person on the far side of the yard, 
crouched down against the inside of our wooden fence. Jimmy noticed something was wrong right away, and he asked me what was bothering me. I didn't know what to tell him, though. I thought if I told him I'd seen someone skulking in the backyard, he would begin to panic. Maybe the guy would come at us, realizing we'd noticed he was there or something. I just whispered to him that we may have to go into the house as soon as possible. Before Jimmy even had the opportunity to respond to what I'd told him, though, another brief crack of lightning illuminated the area. I saw the silhouette once more. This time, it was standing up and looking toward us. I told Jimmy someone was in the backyard. He didn't believe me, though. I grabbed his hand and told him we had to book it for the house. He still thought I was just trying to get back at him for all those urban legends he'd told me. The next crack of lightning, though, revealed that the man was now right outside our tent. This time, Jimmy couldn't help but see him, and he began to scream. The shadow was now at the door of the tent and began trying to pull the zipper open by force. Jimmy and I began to yell and scream for my father, even though it was very unlikely he would hear us during this storm. What happened next happened so quickly, but I was very glad that it did. The back porch light suddenly turned on. I heard what I first thought was a crack of thunder, but instead it turned out to be my father's gun. The person by the tent made a run for it, but my dad yelled at him that he had no problem putting a bullet in his back if he did. The man stopped in place. The police came and arrested the man. Turns out that the very first crack of lightning that had revealed the man to me at first had also happened to wake my father up. He'd gotten worried about us because the lightning was so strong. He went to check on us, and when he did look out the window, the second crack of lightning then revealed the man to my dad, standing in the backyard. He woke my mom up and told her to call the cops. Then he grabbed his gun out of the safe. Jimmy and I spent the rest of the night in the room, and this time we did it without any arguing. It was quite a while before either of us was comfortable sleeping in a tent again. This story is a different kind of scary, but it is still pretty spooky. This happened back when I was in college when on a complete whim, I hopped on the bus and went down to Daytona Beach for spring break. Well, it wasn't a complete whim, I guess. My friend Joey already happened to be down there, and he'd really been bugging me to come down and join him. Joey really didn't work or go to school, but his parents did have a lot of money. Rather than going down to Daytona for spring break for a week, he was there throughout the entire season, he eventually did convince me to come down when he promised he would bring me back after the week was over. I only had enough money to make the trip one way if I was going to spend any money there at all. One thing that Joey had left out about our spring break trip is that he had driven his father's motorcycle to get down there. If I wanted to ride back home, it would have to be on the back of his bike. I was not completely comfortable with that arrangement. I did eventually accept it, though, because if I spent the rest of my money for a ticket home, I wouldn't be able to have any money for spring break itself. I had a good five days or so down there. Then, in order to get back to school on time, Joey would have to take me back home. It would be a two-day drive, and we would have to get a hotel after the first night. Thankfully, he had his parents' magic credit card and would be paying for everything. We got started relatively early in the day. We went up through Florida and eventually made it into Georgia at around 1 p.m. This is when things started to get a bit ominous. It began to get dark very fast as the most foreboding storm clouds I had ever seen in my life began to roll in. These weren't just black clouds. These were green clouds, which blocked out the entire sky. It was springtime in Georgia, and by 4 p.m., it was pitch black outside. The only positive was that it hadn't started pouring yet. We wanted to try and make it as far as we could before having to get the hotel room. I had never seen such a sight in my entire life. I really don't think I can do it justice just by describing it. The clouds looked like they were being driven with purpose down on us. I got truly afraid when they started spinning around like funnels right above our heads. 
I didn't really know if this was indicative of a tornado forming or what, but I could imagine it wasn't a positive thing regardless. Eventually, it began to storm and rain hard. If you've never ridden a motorcycle through a thunderstorm, I can't begin to tell you how scary that is. Each drop of rain slapped us on our faces. My body felt like needles was stabbing into my skin. It hurt real bad. I was worried that the force of the wind and rain would blow our motorcycle off the damn road. But Joey didn't appear to be ready to stop anytime soon. I didn't want to appear like a wuss either, but trust me, I was really scared. We saw a sign for a Holiday Inn at the next exit. It was then that Joey yelled back and asked me if I wanted to take that exit and stop there. I was in severe pain from the storm, and I was cold as well. I was frightened, but I thought about the kind of person Joey was. He was very adventurous, as if you hadn't already figured that out. And for some odd reason, I thought he would have more respect for me if I told him to hold out a bit longer. I yelled back to him, No, let's see how far we can go before we have to stop. Joey laughed and we continued on. I think we went for another hour or so before Joey decided we were going to have to stop right now. It was just too fierce out there. We found an exit with what I believe was a hotel called Quality Inn or something. We checked in and I decided I needed to take a shower first. Joey was fine with that because he wanted to watch the weather anyways. Joey flipped on the television and of course there was a weather report on right away. I'll never forget in my entire life what it said. The town just off the exit that Joey had asked me if we wanted to stop at was hit just a half hour earlier by that tornado. One of the buildings shown on the news as being completely destroyed? The Holiday Inn we were both going to stay at. We were shocked. If we had taken that exit just an hour ago and checked into that hotel, we would not be here right now. We would have been there right when that tornado destroyed it. It was really weird, because I wanted so badly to get out of that storm, but for whatever reason, something told me it was not right to exit at that moment. I live in a small town with my family. I was 19 when this happened. My brother was 13 years old. This happened when he was on spring break from school. My parents had already gone to work, and I had a job too, but I didn't have to go in until later in the day. There was going to be a period of about four hours or so after I went to work that my brother would be home alone in the house. That wasn't too big a deal to us though. He was already 13 years old. On this day, I had about an hour before it was time for me to leave for work. It was around 11 a.m., I believe. When I woke up, it was raining and storming very hard. It was pretty fierce out there. The wind was strong and blowing the trees back and forth. The sky was completely black with clouds. It looked more like the sun had recently set rather than recently having risen. The rain was pounding our house, too. I was the type who didn't like to get up really long before going to work. I had to be there at 12.30, so I woke up at 11, made myself some coffee, and went into the living room to relax for a while. I was watching a bit of TV, and halfway watching the storm as well, when something outside caught my eye. I looked over, only to see a man out in the middle of the storm, walking down the street. He was tall and dressed in all black, but the weirdest thing was, he didn't seem to have an umbrella or even a raincoat. It was quite strange. I figured maybe he had just been out and about and gotten caught in the storm, but he didn't seem to be in any hurry either. As he walked down the street, he watched our house with a strange look on his face. Then he turned the block. I got a feeling something was wrong here, but I tried not to let it bother me too much. As I was watching the television more, about 10 minutes later, it caught my eye once again. I looked out the window and was quite surprised to see the man wandering around the block once more. Just like the last time, he kept glancing at our house, pivoting his head as he walked along. This time, I was much more concerned than I had been before. Before, the man was just a strange weirdo walking around in the rain. 
Now he was a strange weirdo walking around in the rain who seemed to have something on his mind, and it seemed to have something to do with my home. At first, I could have dismissed this all as him just having been caught out in the storm, but walking around the block multiple times indicated he was in no hurry to get anywhere. Just a strange man walking in the rain. I had finished my coffee and I had to get to work soon, but I decided I needed to wait and see if the man would circle our house yet again. I was really hoping it wasn't something other than just a weirdo who liked the rain. Maybe he really wasn't singling out our home. Perhaps he was casing every house on the block for an empty one. This was the third time he walked around, once again looking at our home specifically. I got really concerned now. It was exactly like before, too. I really wasn't sure what to do in this instance. I didn't think the guy had done anything wrong or illegal, so I couldn't call the police on him, but I didn't feel safe leaving my 13-year-old brother home alone. It was a slim chance, but there was a chance this man was going to try to break in when I left or something. I couldn't take my brother to work with me, so I had to find some other way. When I left, all the cars would be gone from the driveway. That may be exactly what this guy was looking for. After going over it in my head again and again, I decided I was being paranoid enough that I should see if I could drop my brother off at a friend's house. I explained to him that I was worried because something weird was going on here. I asked him if he had anybody who would let him stay until my parents got off work. Thankfully, he did. He called up his friend Dylan, and I dropped him off over there and headed to work myself. I double-checked and made sure everything was locked up tight before I left, too. I was working, and the rain was still coming down violently for hours. We were not very busy because of it. Around 6 p.m., though, I got a call from my mother. Someone truly had broken into our house. I wasn't really surprised, although I did feel like an idiot for not having called the police before. What bothered me the most, though, was not that the house had indeed been broken into. What bothered me is that they didn't steal a single thing, or even touch anything. That told me that the man who broke in wasn't trying to steal our things. When I explained what happened to my parents, they were very happy I hadn't left my little brother in the house alone because who knows what would have happened to him. I was 18 years old when this happened, in my senior year of high school. I just started dating a girl who lived an hour away in Bogalusa, Louisiana, and would frequently drive out to go see her on the weekends. If you don't know, Bogalusa sits along a river and is surrounded by many swamps. In my opinion, it's an area notorious for heavy fogs and big flooding. It's also quite rural, and it wasn't uncommon for someone to hit a deer or something when traveling to and fro. Being a young driver, my parents would ask I be home no later than 11pm to avoid these accidents. On this particular day, it had rained quite heavily throughout, and at night it would be a particularly foggy trip back home. The first half of the trip was fairly normal. I drove at the posted speeds and occasionally slowed down when I saw eyes in the tree line. This contributed to the eerie air surrounding these drives. It always felt like there was something lurking about, and I was tempted to gun it out of there. The only way I can describe the feeling accurately is to say there was a certain atmosphere of stillness. Lights barely penetrated the fog, it was so thick. The rain had stopped now, and the road was all but abandoned. It was like life had stopped altogether. Time passed, and halfway through the drive, I finally reached a small bit of civilization. A Dollar General store with its lights still on, a railroad track weaving through the road, and just ahead of me, a car pulled out of a McDonald's drive through The car went pretty slow, which ticked me off because I had to meet a curfew. I stayed behind it, though, in hopes it would just pull off soon. Following down the road, the car and myself left that small town. The path ahead was pitch dark, so I kept following at a good distance and tracked the car's taillights. I was completely exhausted. The car was going so slow it had pushed me past the curfew, and tomorrow I was going to have school anyway. 
I let my mind wander a bit as I rolled the windows down to get some coal there and kept following behind the car. Minutes passed and I was beginning to get quite frustrated. We approached a railroad track that was slightly uphill and being in a hurry, I pulled in close behind the car I had followed. Out of nowhere though, the car in front of me jerked and skidded across the pavement. No more than eight feet in front of me, I could now see an emaciated figure curled up on the tracks. Pale white, with patchy bald hair, a man rocked back and forth, tearing at his face with his fingers. I quickly threw the steering wheel to avoid him and swung my car around him. Maneuvering as best I could, I managed to dodge the man and slammed on the brakes once I had passed by. The car I was following sped along and out of sight, and now I was alone in the surrounding fog. My heart was racing. I clicked on my hazards and unbuckled my seatbelt. Jutting myself out the window, I stared back at what little the flashing lights could illuminate. Silence. Nothing except the ticking of my blinkers. Hello? I gently called out. Are you alright? I didn't hit you, did I? In the distance, the man slowly postured himself upright, and his head snapped over to me. He stood there silently, unmoving. Suddenly, he let out the most inhuman scream I'd ever heard. He broke into a full sprint and started running toward my vehicle. I quickly threw the car into drive and sped away from that scene. Not more than a minute later, I found the person I had been following earlier, who had decided to pull over and park on the road and call someone. I approached behind them and yelled out the window, Did you see that? Yeah, I'm going back, the driver responded to me. He'd called the police in the meantime. We eventually went back to where the man had been, but there was nothing there, just an old railroad. To this day, it's still one of the most weird and scary things that's ever happened to me. I always leave my car unlocked. Always. No matter where it is. No matter what I'm doing. No matter how long it'll be. It's always unlocked. And the reason for this is because I used to live in a very bad neighborhood. There would always be robberies no matter if you did lock it. Back then, I was a broke-ass college kid though. I didn't have shit for anyone to steal. I also didn't have any money to replace broken windows. I noticed that a lot of people would get their windows smashed in in order for people to break into their cars. When I asked around, they told me that the cars with the smashed windows had all been locked, so I left my car unlocked. It's not like I had anything to steal anyway. If they wanted to waste their time rooting around, that's on them. I didn't have any valuables to leave in it, so it's not like I had anything to lose. A few times it had been rummaged through, but I always just cleaned the little mess and moved on with my life. Fast forward to now. I had a closing shift at work about a week ago. I'm a librarian, you see, so I get off at 9 during closing shifts. Not too bad, actually. We all walk out and lock up together. There were two parking lots at my library. One in the front where the books were, and one in the back where the labs and computers were. Most of the employees parked in the back, but this particular time I had chosen to park in the front instead. I said goodbye to everyone else and headed out to my car alone. When I finally reached it, I grabbed the handle and pulled. It wouldn't open. For a few moments, I was confused. Then it hit me. My doors were locked now. Instantly, I was unsettled. I got the feeling I was being watched, but I didn't know why. Maybe it was just the weirdness of knowing I hadn't locked the door when I left. I looked around, checked my back seat even, and unlocked it and jumped in. I started and tore out of that parking lot. When I hit the main road home, there was a bit of traffic. It wasn't a lot given the time of night, but it was pretty slow and kept stopping as well. I still had that creeping feeling, but I brushed it off. Surely I had just watched too many horror movies. Then though, as I stopped at a light, I heard a loud screech and a thumping sound. My trunk had just popped open. I waited until I got to a well-lit area to stop. I pulled into the parking lot of a gas station, 
shaking in my boots. I made sure there were other people around and tiptoed my way over to my trunk. Nothing was in there as I checked, of course, but I did see my things had been moved around to make what looked like a person-sized hiding spot. I might start locking my door from now on. Update. We got feedback on some video surveillance footage at my work. A man who's a bit off that comes into my work a lot got into my car and tinkered around with it for a few minutes. Then he popped my trunk and got in. Apparently he hadn't closed it hard enough to latch it though, so when I stopped it jiggled open. It wasn't just my car either. He'd messed with a couple of other vehicles as well. It seems mine was just the only one that was unlocked. 